And now the third of our three Wessex tales by Thomas Hardy and his greatest story of the supernatural. We present Janet McTeer as Rhoda and Catherine Hurlbert as Gertrude in Thomas Hardy's The Withered Arm. certain when it first started. It were a sly thing. Sometimes there, and then not. At first, I thought it were no more than the noises of the house. Perhaps some twisted shadow made by the fire on the wall. I was not fearful in any way. I was not fearful at the beginning. But then it began creeping into my night time. It's cold. Your mother's had a dream no more. Will, oh. will you dream again then? If I go away? Come and keep us both warm, my little lad. No mind you keep your cold feet to yourself. <laughs> Seems so, at times. Like the shadows are at dusk. They rise up with the coming of dark. I dare say they're not exactly real, no. What'd you dream? It's always the same, you know that. Is it the lady? Aye. The lady, right enough. But what'd she want? She says nothing. She has a way of talking with her eyes. Not that I see much of a mind. She skulks, like, over in that corner, mostly. <gasps> but you said it were only a dream. Oh. So it is, little lad, so it is. <sighs> Dear me. Have you not had dreams that were all too real to yourself, then? Of course you have. But my dreams go away. And so shall this one. You shall see. Ask me next week about it. I shan't know a word you're on about. Would there be a dream if my father had stayed with us? Would there? You must not think him a bad man. You must never think that. But he doesn't speak to you. He doesn't come to the house. There is much for him to do. He has another life to live than ours. But everyone's saying he's to marry another lady. Why did he not marry you? He gave me you. It was more than enough, little lad. Now then, back to your own bed. Does he care for me as you do, Mother? My father? Aye, lad. He cares. Though the eye be elsewhere, there is no forgetting. Shall I go along with you, oh, my sweet, pretty, fair maid? With your red, rosy cheeks and your pearly black hair. No, but you may fall out to me, and such 
Are you not the prettiest thing ever seen in these parts? <laughs> they all come out to see the new Mrs. Lodge parade. Oh, you are showing me off, husband. Indeed I am. You are something of which a man can be rightly proud. <laughs> we will be happy together, won't we, Thomas? There is nothing in the whole world to prevent it, sweet Gertrude. And if there were, I should see it off without a second's delay. <laughs> running to keep up with us since we left town. Well, such a sight will be an event in his life. You must let him enjoy his day. He smiles at me even. I think he may have looked at us in the hope that we might relieve him of his load rather than from curiosity. See what he carries on his back. Well, these country lads are brought up to carry, my dear. They think little of it. Besides, the load has more size than weight. Behind the trees now. He falls back slightly. I shall lose him at the bend. You have heart enough for the whole world, my dear. Come on! You leave my dreams, do we? What is it about your hatefulness that it must hide in the shadows so? What do you want of me? You circle my bed nightly like light round the lamp. And you weep. Yet like no other. A weeping that brings no pity. Where is the heart that makes those tears then? You bait me, lady. But I stay as I am. Show me your face, woman. Ah! Point at me, do you? Like always. An arm and fingers as cracked as your soul. You bring ugliness, lady, always that. But for what purpose, hey? Answer that then. Show me your face, I say. Show it. Young. <sighs> you shall not point your crooked arm in my direction no more. Hear me, do it. You shall not. See, I curse it. I swear vengeance on your pointing lady. Each time you dare come, you will shrivel under my sight. Damn that arm! And all that goes with it! I shall not forget! I have every word in my head I've said so. Say it again. I'm to look if I can see her at the market. You know your father's carriage well now. 
You're going to have to put in there. Aye, that's the red wheel. And what are you to look for? I'm to see whether the new lady is dark or fair, and if she's tall. As tall as I be. Yeah. Or not, depending. And whether she looks as if she's worked or not in her life. Your hands will tell you that. You know what mine look like. Mm. See if hers are the same. Have I remembered it all right, then? We must know her kind, that's all. And will that make the dreaming stop? When we know what she looks like? The dreaming is her, lad. It is the why I need to know. Well, they weren't at the market, and that's for sure. So, I waited at the edge of the village and was lucky after a while. Though the carriage were going at a fair pace, she was smiling. And I could see her face plain. Well, go on, Jack. Is she ladylike then? Oh, I am more. A lady complete in every way. Young? Well. What colour is her hair and face? Her hair is lightish, I should say. And her face is comely as a doll's. And that's about as near as I could get. Her eyes be not dark then, like mine. More of a bluish sort of turn, I'd say. And her mouth is red. Making her teeth seem shiny when she smiles. Now, this be most important. Was there any disfigurement? No. What, of any kind? No. Face? No. Maybe hands? No. Did she not No, really... there was nothing of that kind. You are sure? My father was smiling at her as if she were the sun itself. Aye. And for the moment, no doubt, that's what he'll think her. Now listen, Jack. You go to Holmstoke Church tomorrow morning. Now she's sure to be there, being new to the parish. Go early. And notice her walking in, and so get a better look. Watch her hands, an arm. Perhaps there's something you missed. You could well see for yourself. The church ain't too far. I go to see her. I wouldn't think to look up even if she were to pass my window. She were with Mr. Lodge, of course. She were with your father. I said so. They rode in the carriage, same as he do always on a market day. He took no notice of you, lad? None. Twere like usual. Aye, like usual. Not tall, but rather short, though very pretty. She wore a white bonnet and a silver-coloured gown. It wooed and whistled so loud when it rubbed against the pews that the lady coloured up and pulled it close to keep it from touching. Everyone were looking at her. Mr Lodge, well, he seemed very pleased with it all, and his waistcoat stuck out right proper. Her name is Gertrude, so to say. No! You! You! in that corner. I'm not having closer. Stay in the shadow where I cannot drop any see. I've no wish to know your face again. Stay, I say, no! You shall not, you shall not! Be. So you come out to see me done down. <gasps> yes. That's more like it, isn't it? No, you'll not let me be now, not you, my beauty. 
But I already know Rhoda will not let you rest neither. Not as long as she breath she won't. How can he know that? Tis the lady. I've seen and spoken to her yesterday. She asked whether I was the boy she always saw carrying wood to market. And how did my boots keep out the wet, being as cracked as they were? Uh, so she's come. I, I hope I am not too much of an intrusion, calling in such a way. But I happened to see Jack's boots were letting in the water, and I, I brought these, which I hope will not offend you. I have often seen him when my husband That's and I... It's a kindness, Mum. Thank you. He is a handsome boy, your son. He's sturdy enough, for sure. He eats better than I do. Can I give you more tea? Oh, thank you. The walk up that hill of yours is bad enough without the bearing of the weight of a laden basket. You should have said you were calling. I could have met you at the bottom. I was wondering... I was wondering whether it... whether we might be friends. Is that possible, do you think? Your son, Jack, and... I'm a milkmaid, Mum. Someone who waits on the kindness of others for my own son gets new boots. Are you saying that is a reason we cannot be friends? Seems to me rather an unlikelihood. I could bring Jack clothes. Could help, but I would like to. You hold your arm like a log of wood. Is there something that ails thee? It began as a stiffness, no more. A strain, I thought. But it worsens. No doubt it will pass. There is pain? At times, yes. Have you not seen a doctor, then? My husband insisted on my visiting a surgeon of some repute. I was to bathe it in hot water twice a day, he said, but... Yeah, it is no better. Will you let me see it? Oh, there is little to see at the moment. It comes and goes. There, just above the wrist. My husband says it looks like some witch's mark. That's fancy. I wouldn't mind such talk if I were you. Oh, I do not mind for myself. It is a small thing after all, but I feel... Well, it seems to make my husband less, less fond of me. Men think so much of personal appearance. Perhaps I should not say that. Some men think that way. He, for one. Oh, so it is said, like. He will not talk about it, Siv. Always saying I must do something. But I have been to the doctor. What more can I do? This is a reason why I need a friend, Rhoda. Someone to whom I can talk. I, I, I feel such a one might be you. Without such, I... I'm entirely alone. You could keep it always covered. Men don't bother much about what they don't see. I did consider that, but he looks at me so... He will not let me forget. All farmers think that way. They don't like things to go and change on them. Well, I I'm not sure it's quite like that. Have it your way. He was always very fond of me at first. You're not telling me any fresh news. How do you mean that? Oh, just men. Farmer men, especially. They look at their women much like their stock. They need a return on their investment. Oh, but it was never that way with us. Mm. 
Well, all I can say is I hope the disfigurement goes soon. When men turn from a woman, they go quickly cold. And no amount of later eating them back up makes much difference in my knowing. You're not very reassuring, Ruda. Reassuring was never in my nature, Mum. And that's a fact. Will we be friends, then? Is that what you want? Can you answer me a private question? As friends might do. I, if I can, I will, surely. Lady. Do you... Dream. What is it, Thomas? You've not spoken since supper. Is there something troubling you? It is nothing at all. Once you would never let me comb my own hair at night. It was something I more. have said it is nothing, have I not? What time do you wish us to leave for market tomorrow? I had thought I might travel alone this week. You do not want me to come with you. But we always travel to market together. Well, this time I would go alone. It's no great matter. Thomas, please talk to me. You say things that I no longer understand. You never give me reasons. Only what you shall do and I shall not. There is no knowing the why. The why? So it is the why you seek, my lady? Then tell me the why of this. Why is it that you are the sole wife in the whole county that must comb her hair with one arm only, since the sight of the other offends the very mirror itself? Why that, then? Oh, why do you say such things to me? Another why? Is it not obvious, woman? Is my social disgrace not then apparent to you? Can you point to any other man of our acquaintance whose wife must bind her arm against her side as if it were septic to the rest of her body? Can you answer me that? It's not my fault, Thomas. The Lord knows it is not my fault. And is it mine, then? I ask you, woman, is your withered arm any fault of mine? Is it? Did I marry that arm, perhaps? What would you have me do? Tell me, Thomas, and I will do it. It is only my not knowing how to please you that keeps us apart in this way. I will do anything. I think for the present, it is better if you simply kept from my sight. Rhoda! Lady. Good morning. I, I was just about to call on you. Under a triangle? They say that he is the only one that can find the cause, and so perhaps the cure. The arm grows much worse, Rhoda. It, it grows more useless by the day. Soon I should not be able to use it at all. My husband. Conjurer Trendle is no medical man. That you know. I have no care for that. I need only someone to help. Will you help me, Rhoda? Oh, can I be of any help to you? I know nothing of such things. But you know this Trendle. He is a man with... powers, so they say. But you know where I can find him. It is about five mile in the heart of Egdon. Rhoda, will you come with me? Oh, no. My husband must not know, so I cannot go by horse. I would need to walk. Will you, Rhoda? Will you help me? She was begging with her eyes, and all the life in me rose up to put an end to her misery, knowing as I did the kind of treatment she could expect from the man that was her husband. But I feared the conjurer Trendle even more than I feared the unknown in her. He would know. He would find the cause right enough. And he would name it to her. What then? Knowing me then for what I truly was, would she change into what I had seen in some night form? 
In her days, she knew nothing of what I had to suffer at her hands. Nothing must now come to open that still locked door. Rhoda, please. We walked in silence, and I was glad of it. Her company was not unwelcome, but what contained her heart I could have wished elsewhere. The clouds came down to meet the land, and there was feeling of rain. I kept to her side on which the good arm lay, though what proper reason I had for that I do not know, were a strange thing, making me puzzle over myself. In all my years I had never known such a feeling of confusion. When the rain came, we sheltered a little, the tree above us whispering and cutting at our unshared thoughts like some third person. And then we moved on, and soon the house came into sight. Why does the other woman right outside? If that is what she prefers. Who gave you my name? Y you are well known, Count Trentle. Ask any man. I don't do half what I used to. You should know that. This is why I came. Come closer to the light of the window. My eyes are poor. Uh, bend it at the elbow. Uh, and if it's right. Uh, wow. Well, I have to tell you that no amount of medicine will cure that. How can that be true? This is the work of an enemy. An enemy? What enemy? I have no such thing. Oh, I suppose no one here, so. I can show the person to him. I myself shall not know who it be. It's a matter of your own choosing. Will the knowing cure me? Nothing else will. And that you can rest. Then I would move. All right here. Take this glass between your hands. Now, I shall break an egg in the bottom. You must look closely at the shape it makes. If all goes well, in it you will see your tormentor. Does what I say make sense to you? Yes. You cannot go back on what you see. Only turn away a farm. Nothing will be the same again. You wish to move on? I have said so. Break the egg, old man. Let's be done with it. Too many words between us for either one to talk. 
and the silence gathered and limped down the path before us like some lame dog. I knew nothing of what she might know, but in my heart felt it might be all. And then, as we cleared the brow of the hill, lifting our heads into the lowering sun all at once, I could see the way I must take. That night, I took the boy from his bed, wrapped what we could carry in a blanket, and turned from the house towards, well, who knew? We walked together as she and I had earlier that day, without a word, without a hope. I looked back only once, and though I'm far from sure, I thought I saw a face at the window, a thin, older face with eyes that spoke of nothing. And then I saw again, inward-like, as clear as I ever had, that the figure of my dreams was of my own making. That the years that weighed down my heart had taken on form and voice, and that I had used the innocence of my husband's new wife to carry that burden as I could not. Then the pity came, like grass on wasteland and I with no worthy explanation for either her or myself. The moon pulled the sky about her, and with our heads down, we walked towards something else. Search the earth, then. You remember well, Conjurer Trendle. Oh, I call me that. I'm only a poor old Eatman earning a living like others. As best he may. It is what others call you, is it not? I have little with which to make you welcome. There is some bride. I did not come for your food, old man. You are changed. Yes. I am changed. It takes a true egg to fully curdle the eye. I am sorry if I did not show you proper respect. Oh, you were angry with me because you needed me. You see that too. Speak as you will. But I must eat my broth. You see my arm. That is what it can now be called. Like a twisted branch of some dead tree. It is useless to me and to any other. You have nothing to say. Who came here to listen to your own voice, woman? No one else will, it seems. Trendle eats his broth. Six years of marriage, and only a few short months of love. Is that the lot of the common heart, old man, or mine alone? If only I could be again as when he first saw me. I was so... You can cure warts that I know, then why not this? Bring back my husband to me. For pity's sake! You think too much of my powers. I am old and weak now. It is too much for me to attempt. Oh, then you should be my only hope. <laughs> Desperation is no friend of pride, my fine lady. You must understand that what ails you is less of an illness than the nature of a blight. It is a hidden thing. And must be cast off strangely. But how? That is what I ask. Well, not so easily. You already know. There is only one chance known to me. I've not known it ever fail in kindred conditions. But it is hard to carry out. 
especially for a woman. Tell me then. I must know. It needs a body. A freshly killed corpse. How long must it be this time? The business is such that I cannot accurately say. Is it important that you know? You're away so much of late. It is business matters, as I've said. We do not maintain our standards from thin air, my dear. Do you care for me, Thomas? Do you continue to care for me? I beg your pardon? As it is said, a husband should care for a wife. Gertrude, is there something you wish to say to me? I wish to tell you that I am very unhappy. That is all. I cannot imagine why. I take that for granted. What puzzles me is why the fact should so little concern you. Could it be, perhaps, that I am sure you are mistaken? Am I not to know my own state of mind? It is not uncommon with married women, Gertrude. I mean no disrespect. I have taken medical opinion on the matter. Medical? Your arm. What of my arm? There is no explanation. Do you think I do not know that? Yet it is there, for all to see. What are you saying? I say there is no reasonable cause for it. That is all. If natural events were to prevail, it should not have happened at all. Oh, but it has, Thomas, it has. You've taken to sleeping in your own room because it has. Reasonable it may not be, but true it is. I think it better if you did not raise your voice. You are my wife, Gertrude. You will be treated with all the courtesy and consideration that position demands. Of that you need have no fear. I am also a woman. Am I not? You are a disfigured woman. And that, as you know full well, is a genuine cause of regret to us both. I cannot see the necessity for walking. I am not over fond of your house, to be truthful. It has too many corners, and all of them are dark. <laughs> if I had known that with your only reservation, lady, I could have shown you half a dozen more places we could have sat without climbing a hill. Let us sit here, then. <sighs> do I treat you so badly, old man? People treat others like they do first treat themselves. That's the way of it. There's no true caring for another till the heart is warm towards itself. You always talk in riddles. Riddles is only what folks don't see for themselves. <sighs> Men judge their workings through the notions they have about themselves. That don't make for much work to my mind. Enough of this talk. You have never asked for money from me. Not once in all these years. Had I needed it, I might have. What do you need? You cannot be so different to any other man. I am different to your husband. Why do you say that? Why, why different to him? Because he is not a man at all. Which is what your true trouble is. Not rich, not poor. Not cruel, not kind. Only the shifting appearance of such. He has no manners how that which was given him by others. He can never know what to do for what is truly best, since what is best is always out of reach. He was never himself. I do not understand. No more do you. We would not have had to climb this hill together if that were so. My disfigurement repulses him. Why blame him for that? Do you not feel the same towards it? For me, it is different. Why oh, so? Do you not both feel the arm is more the person than the proper worth of what you be? You are wrapped around with each other's goyle lady, and neither with any pity for the other's clothes. I have said I do not wish this kind of talk. If you could stay home, you would. You're here because that cannot be. 
You mentioned a body when we last met. There was need for it to be freshly killed. So you said. You must touch with the blighted limb the neck of a man that has been freshly hanged. Before he's cold, just after he's been cut dead. Hanged? But how would... How would I get such a thing? And how could that possibly do good? It will turn the blood. Turn it back to its older way. You must get to the jail where there's a hanging and wait for him when he's brought down from the gallows. <sighs> Lots of done it, though not many women. The last I sent was over a dozen years ago. It were a skin complaint, if I remember. And they were cured? Oh, I, I were cured right enough. My husband is away at present. I well, the details are your own. I wish dear none of them. I have told you the facts. What you do with them is for you alone. Would it be possible, perhaps, if you... No, lady. This is something you have to do for yourself. No one can help you. Ah, no. I must return to my dark corners. I dare say you'll find your own way back. Trendle, Trendle! Where will I find the nearest place for such things? Look for the hangman at Casterbridge. He is a man suited to your purpose. But take a full purse. Casterbridge. That's why you're here. I've seen such looks on others before. You've come for the iron. Am I right? They said you were the man I should see. A lady, right enough. Us don't get too many ladies. Though others do come on their behalf, I often suspect. It is a common plight, the last resort. I will not ask you to sit down on account there ain't much space, and the likelihood of what space there is to improbable harm to your finery. Damp is everywhere now as it sits on a river, but no fault in that, to my mind. It is a saying that calls me both into sleep and back into day, and I'd not live without it. Having said that, which is of no account to your good self, I must also say I am an understanding man, my dame. And will listen sympathetically. I am here for myself. The best of reasons. The best of reasons. Here now. Say, and this is the rope I shall use. I feel it's in you. Moon eh? flatted that thing. It does the job to such a bit. It do. I sews it by the inch after the event like, but you can have even a yard if you have a wish. It can work miracles. Some freshly used rope. I have not come for rope. Have you not? Well, then there's not too much else I can offer. <laughs> ah! Tis the seeing of the deed you're after, then. That's it. Well, all can be arranged, of course, but there the charge be more than is usual, understandably enough, since there are other considerations involved. Uh, will you let me speak my mind, sir? If you wants me to undertake country work, I can't come. I never leaves Castlebridge for gentle nor simple, and that's that. My sole calling is as an officer of justice. What time is tomorrow's execution? Are you a relative, then? The matter has to go forward. I make no exceptions. I am an officer of justice, as I've just told you. What time? The same as usual, 12 o'clock. Or well, soon after there's the London Mail coach to get in. I always wait for that in case of a reprieve. A reprieve? Oh, God forbid that that should happen. Hey? 
<laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm not that keen on the idea myself. Business being business, as to said. Yeah, still, if every young lad deserved to be let off, this one do. He just turned a and present only by chance when the A-Rick were fired. But they've chosen to make an example of him. There haven't been so much damage of property this way lately. No, he'll swing all right. Though he often thinks justice be a somewhat contrary thing at times. I need to touch him after death. As a charm for an affliction, I, I was oh, advised. Now I see. Well, I've had such people, of course. It's just that you didn't quite look the sort for a bit of blood turning. But you'll not take offence, I know. What's the complaint? Uh, that's always an interest of mine. The wrong kind for this, I'd be bad. Uh, my arm. Ah. It's all withered looking. Wow, that's a class of subject to be sure. I, I like to look at that wound. It is as suitable for the cure as ever I've seen. Take out on that account. Twas a knowing man that sent me, whoever he was. Oh, you can arrange all that is necessary, then. Well, you should probably have gone to the governor of the jail, of course, with your doctor and delivered to him your name and address. That's the way it used to be done, if I recollect. Still, perhaps you had in mind something more private. Well, I'm not one to pry, but not to seem your situation. You are right, private. The person in question is my husband. Huh. Well, don't you go worrying. I'll get you a touch of the corpse, all right? <laughs> Mind there'd be a trifling fee involved in the operation that oh. many for expenses. I shall meet all your costs, sir. You have a turn of phrase of which I could grow most fond. Now, to some detail. Where is it now? It? You mean it. Well, he's living, uh. Just inside that little window up there in the far wall, you could see it clear, and if there was no dirt on the glass... And how am I to proceed? It's so simple enough. I'll be waiting at the little wicker gate in the wall, though not later than one o'clock. You shall find it a little further up this lane. Mm. I will open it from the inside, as I shan't be coming home to dinner till he's cut down. There now. That be a quarter past the hour. You take your lead from that clock, lady. Can I have any lateness for a touching of the court? There is not all the time you might wish, that must be said. His relatives will be here soon enough to collect him. There's his box in the corner. Now, approach him. Hey, don't be put off by the sight, lady. You only do look as if he lives. See, the head will rest on either shoulder. It is a good way of telling. Should you need the skill at some future time, live necks do not move in such a fashion. Oh, he's so young. Eighteen years, I told you, an old, pretty well innocent year, my old account. He has no business lying here right now. There's not much point to all that, no? I do not think... Oh, you can, you can, lady. All I have misgivings at first. You... I mean, take you by the arm. Hmm? Close your eyes, if you so wish. I will guide you. But he looks so... Hey, I bet it is not a proper life, you see. That has all gone. It is the life of sinew and blood that remains only. And it is that life you need to aid your own affliction. Take courage, lady. Now, give me your arm. Never mind the bone. <laughs> no matter. Keep your eyes closed. I will guide you. Permit me to roll up your sleeve, lady. I do so only for the sake of the time left us no more. There. Now we'll be cured. 
Hey, hold! Lady, hold! Keep the arm to the neck until the blood will turn! <laughs> what is this? Well, you see, sir, we were not expecting to see you. Until some Out! Place. Yes, sir. In heaven's mercy, Gertrude, what are you doing in this place? How soft he does look. See what they have done to his poor neck. A neck I could once cut round with my own hands. And his hair. <laughs> Come closer, Mr. Lodge. Come see our dear son. Let us finally be a united family around this table. But I don't understand. This is no place for you, my fine lady. Better you leave now. A father and mother have come to collect their dead son for burial. And it is only decent they now be left alone with their grief. Rhoda. You first came into my life through both dream and day. And not knowing neither. That weren't your fault. No more than you were meant to be here this time and place. But I have little heart left for any save this poor boy. And the woman he's left me. I know your plight, lady. But tis far away. And all my sorrow is used up. You shall earn my gratitude best by going away now and leaving us be. Thomas. Perhaps we both helped take the life from her. I don't know. Me with his coldness. Me with a lie that had lasted most of my days. It is difficult to know such things. But if the heart be not true, then nothing much else be. It took her three days in the dying. And that from nothing that could be said to be the rightful cause. She went out like some ended candle. A wick no longer fed by what gave light. Her blood was turned all right. But the withered arm remained at her side, which was more than could be said for her husband. Mr. Lodge, my dear boy's father, was never seen in Casterbridge again. I watched his face that day, his eyes cast in a cloak over the body of our son, and I knew then it were the last I was to see of him. And Rhoda, what of Rhoda? Well, She's back where she was, as before. She's more bent in form now. And at her forehead, the hair is quite worn away, perhaps by such long pressing against the milking cows. With each year added to my life, the land seems younger still. The heather springs more readily and the grasses look with greater pleasure at the sun, it seems. I wait my time out, not as the seasons do, knowing they will come again, but hoping only for my proper end, so making complete what has already been. I do not dream now. I fancy dreams belong to the shadows the heart casts upon itself when left lonely, when needed others are not here but somewhere else. Now I have no others. I am Rhoda alone, waking, working, and sleeping again. I am waiting Rhoda. Nope. 
I do not dream now. The Withered Arm by Thomas Hardy was dramatised by Colin Hayden Evans. Rhoda was played by Janet McTeer, Gertrude by Catherine Hurlbert, Thomas by Graham Padden, Kundra Trendle by Roger Hume, Jack by Janet Dale, and The Hangman by Bill Wallace. The music from traditional sources was arranged and played by John Kirkpatrick and Sue Harris, and the play was directed at Pebble Mill by Nigel Bryant. <laughs>